Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you the story of Danny. Narrated by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. On the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And now, here's our distinguished host, Mr. Edward Arnold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. We are very proud to have as our guest this Sunday the distinguished author and religious leader, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. His books, such as The Power of Positive Thinking, have brought new meaning to life for millions of people. Dr. Peel will narrate a dramatic story transcribed from the life of Daniel, one of the wisest and most courageous men of biblical times. Now, here is Frank Goss. You can say Merry Christmas in the very merriest way. You can wish Christmas joy in words of reverence and faith with a hallmark card that says what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And the familiar hallmark and crown on the back of your Christmas card tells your friends, too, that you cared enough to send the very best. And now, with Dr. Norman Vincent Peale as our narrator, Mr. Arnold brings you the story of Daniel on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Five hundred years before the birth of Christ in the town of Jerusalem, there was born unto David and Abigail a son, and his name was Daniel. He was an unusual child, and as he grew to manhood, it was apparent he possessed great wisdom and courage. And above all else, he possessed faith. A man's faith. They've coined great things to say about it. We walk by faith, it said, not by sight. And faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith moves mountains. These and all the others. They have a least common denominator. That faith is the inner strength that sustains us in the face of terrible trouble. Which was his belief? His faith. This young man who had been carried off as a prisoner of war, yet who won a high place in the Babylonian court of King Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar died, and his son Belshazzar was made king. And Daniel was out of favor. Let there be no more talk of this God of the Jews. Let there be a feast to the old God. And let the wine be poured in the golden vessels, and let it be drunk by all. Let us praise the gods of gold and of silver. Let there be a feast. <laughs> in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, your father... I proclaimed I wanted no more talk of them, and even you may not recall them. Yes, I... Oh, king, approach me, Cyrus. And you, Amosi. And how does it go with my philosophers? We have brought a gift. Oh, a carving. In ivory. Which hangs from a golden chain, plucked from the most high temple of Jerusalem. Give it to me. Ah. You see how it is fashioned most intricately. Yet at the end of it, how cleverly it is shaped into a hand. Used by devout priests to read the words of the scroll. From which they pray. Therefore, if there is magic in their prayers... There is magic in this gift. My dear... Yes. Wear it, then, about your neck, so that its magic may infuse you. It is truly beautiful. Now. No! What is it? What has happened? My king. Look. There. Opposite the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall. A man's hand. A disembodied hand that lights upon the wall. Oh, no. No, no. What does it mean? It's an omen. Fool, of course it's an omen. But what does it mean? Philosopher, you, Mosi, 
learned man, most wise. The words, many, many, tickle, fasten, which have been written now upon my palace wall. What do they mean? Uh, uh, many, uh, many. Uh, I, I, I would need time to study, uh, to cast certain formulae which are known only to me, and so... Then uh, you will tell me, Cyrus. Tell me, then, what means the omen? Speak. Speak! Uh, I do not know. Did you hear? Do you hear, my court? My philosophers do not understand this omen, this handwriting upon the wall. Soothsayers. In no court in all the world are there soothsayers such as mine. Tell me, then, in all my kingdom there is no wisdom. Oh, king. Who speaks? What woman's voice speaks from a brain of such cunning as will tell me the secret of those words? It is I, your mother. Then, Queen, come near and tell me the wisdom I neglected to inherit. Speak, then. Once, when there was your father, there was a Jew whose name was Daniel. 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 The name teases me. Daniel. Your father's strong right arm and his conscience. A Jew whose name was Daniel. A youth of Judah. Yes, I remember. A youth of Judah. An interpreter of dreams. Skillful in all wisdom and understanding. Then let him show the interpretation of the words. Let Daniel be brought. summoned me, O king. If you are Daniel, of the children of captivity, of Judah, I am he. I have heard of you, how the spirit of the gods is in you. Of the Lord God of that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in you. Consider then the words on the wall. Many, many, take a fasten. Then make an interpretation and make it known to me and you will clothed with scarlet, and have a chain of gold about your neck, and you will be the third ruler of my kingdom. Give your rewards to another. I want nothing from you. For your sake, I hope you are cunning as well as arrogant. Listen. Listen to me and what I say. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. And all people, and nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened by pride... You prattle, man of Judah, and there is no wisdom in you. Like your father, you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and you have praised gods which see not, nor hear, nor know. Therefore was sent the hand that wrote... The words, the words! This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Take her... You are weighed in the balances and have been found wanting. Ufarsen, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. This is the meaning of the thing. Then Belshazzar the king did a strange thing. He proclaimed that Daniel should be one of the most powerful men in the kingdom again, as if to make a quick atonement for all his past sin, as if Daniel should be grateful and intercede for him. But it was too late. That very night, Belshazzar was murdered. And the kingdom was given over to Darius, the Mede. The first thing Darius did was to call Daniel to him. Come, Daniel, with me to the window. And with me, watch. My people do me honor. And you receive it as it leaves their hearts. For there is humbleness in you. Below the hosts of a hundred and twenty princes march. I have set open three presidents, of whom you shall be the first. I will serve you. All the princes shall account to you, and only you shall account to me. Ah, there is an excellent spirit in you, Daniel, and I will avail myself of it. And for this spirit, you have set me over the whole realm. Yes. It is the spirit of the one Lord God, Darius. This is talk of which I have no understanding. Therefore... The one Lord God. And this is the spirit you should set over the whole realm, mightier than me. Yes, and mightier than you. Mightier than all men put together. Proclaim it... Do not vex me with this talk, Daniel. 
To rule a kingdom is to know only days of trouble. Therefore, do only what you must to ease my hours. Do not embitter them. We will talk of it another time. This God of whom you speak, in all your wisdom, you still feel the need of him and cling to him? For all wisdom springs from him. Daniel. Yes? I am troubled, and I am lonely, and... Another time. We will speak of it then. Daniel was a faithful friend and advisor to the king, Darius. As in all courts, however, there were intrigues, and jealousies, and resentments. And mostly, there was resentment over the fact that an outsider, a hostage, really, should be the second man in the kingdom. Daniel, they said, an interpreter of dreams, that's all. A reader of handwritings on the wall. And what bothered many of the people was that Daniel was different. His religion was different. And that was a stigma, they decided. You are troubled, Cyrus. It is why I asked you to walk with me here in the garden. Oh? Consider, yes. What if Daniel were dead? What if he were dead? What then? Why, I'll not say it obscurely, but rather like this. What if Daniel were dead? What if we would cause his death? Murder him? Murder him. But how? Surely, philosopher, there must be a way. There is a way for all things. Therefore, there must be a way to murder Daniel. Yes. And they thought about it. And after a while, the trap was set for Daniel, man of Judah, man of faith. moment, we'll bring you the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. I'm sure that during the year, many of you have chuckled over the sophisticated line drawings of Steinberg, and you've got to stop to admire one of the hauntingly delicate illustrations by that fine American artist, Holda. And many of you, too, have read and reread the warm, homey poetry of Edgar A. Guest. Well, I'm proud to announce that you'll find these three distinguished favorites represented in the exciting new Hallmark Hall of Fame collection of Christmas cards. This impressive collection assembles boxes of cards by famous artists and writers in one convenient display. In addition to Holder, Steinberg, and Edgar A. Guest, you'll find Christmas cards by Grandma Moses, Norman Rockwell, Sir Winston Churchill, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, and others. Your friends will get added enjoyment receiving cards designed for them by famous people, and they'll be delighted to display these distinguished Hallmark cards in their homes. So be sure to look for the Hallmark Hall of Fame collection of Christmas cards now at the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. Remember, each of these cards not only bears the name of a famous artist or writer, but also another famous name, that familiar Hallmark and crown on the back of the card to show you care enough to send the very best. And now with Dr. Norman Vincent Peale as our narrator, Edward Arnold brings you the second act of Daniel. <laughs> Babylon was a world of astounding beauty, of cascading waterfalls and hanging gardens, a city of wealth and of corruption. And it was against this background, 500 years before Christ, that Daniel lived and was a member of the royal court. In the pagan world of the Babylonian conspirators, a man such as Daniel was a dangerous man. Because in power, in stature, Daniel was second only to the king. And in this world where men bowed only to images of gold and of silver, who more suspect, who more vulnerable than the man who bowed only to God? And this then was the plot to ruin Daniel, to murder him with his own fate. And for this they came to the palace of Darius and to his throne. King Darius, live forever. 
welcome our mercy and rise and come close. O King Darius, live forever. Approach me, Cyrus. You are welcome to me. It has been a day of loneliness and of duties done, not done. And somehow a day of emptiness and blaze of sun. But you are king. King. And no wind to stir the leaves of my gardens, or to cool the great marble wastes. We have but this instant come from the council, King Darius. Let us get to the business of it. Your voice gives it an urgency, Cyrus. Was it of such stuff that boldened you to speak thus to me? It was. It was indeed. Then tell it to me. It was agreed in council that you should lay down a statute, a law, to protect you from the traducers, from the disloyal, from the enemies of you and your kingdom. To protect me. A law to the effect that whoever shall pray or offer petition to any man or any god other than you, O king, this man shall be cast into the den of lions. Done by the council of prefects and satraps who sought for the safety of their wondrous king. Cyrus. Yes? Hear me, Cyrus. This the urgency, this your impatience, that my hand shall write death. Yes. Death to those who are traitor to my king. And death to them who kneel before any man but thee. And death to him who pleads before any god but thee. Sign it. Sign it, O king. Sign it in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which is unalterable. Give me the statute. I will sign it. As of the Medes and the Persians. Now leave me. And you will live forever, O king. For eternity, O king. Amosi, yes, evening, and a task done, and Babylon before me. If you were I, how would you use this sweet evening of Babylon? If I were you, yes. and we are as much alike as brothers, why, I would go to the house of Daniel. Daniel, the purified one whose house is bare of nightingales and frankincense and other joys, why? Why to Daniel? Why, to watch him pray to a god other than our beloved king. Ah, you have done it. You have found sweet usage of a an evening. Come then, Amosi, hasten. And they went to Daniel's house and watched unobserved as Daniel prayed to his god. The evening prayer. The conspirators went again to the palace of the king and told him how three times a day Daniel offered homage, made supplication to a god other than Darius, such as they had seen this evening. Darius didn't believe them, and they said they would prove it. To come with them the next morning, to stand outside Daniel's house, to hear for himself, Darius agreed, and the next morning went with them and heard. For lo, God is exalted and we cannot know. The number of his years is unsearchable. For he draws up the drops of water. They pour out his rain in his flood, which the clouds pour down. Lo, he spreads his mist about him and covers Daniel! the top. Daniel! Daniel! And covers the tops of the mountains. For therewith he judges peoples. He gives food in abundance. He covers his two hands with lightning and commands it concerning the mark. You hear? You hear how he mocks you, my king? Daniel, come to me. A command, come to me. I will come. He mocked you, almighty king. Before your face, he mocked you. You see now his treachery. You Send see him now. Let Daniel tell it to me. You heard him, king. You heard how he made farce of your law, of the law of the Medes and the Persians. Almighty king. They say you mock me, Daniel. Cyrus and Amosi say it. They lie. But mine own ears heard it. How gently and gently your voice... What did you say? And to whom? A prayer. To my Lord God. You hear him? Silence! Hear... This prayer, you called it. It had sweetness in it. And a pleading. Yes. But not to me. No. Ask him, O king. Did he not know the law you signed? The law of death to traitors, to those did who... you know of it, Daniel? 
This law they had me sign. I knew of it. Think what you say, Daniel. Think on it. I knew of the law. There is death in it, death by the jaws of the beast. And still you... Still I will pray to my God, the only God. Death to you, death to you, traitor! If it is God's will. Do not grieve me, Daniel, nor forsake me. Recant your God. Say there is no other God but Darius. Say it! I cannot, for blessed is the name of my God forever and ever. Seize him! Seize him! Seize him for the lions! And may your God save you. In, traitor. In, Jew. Dear God, I am cast among the beasts. God. And Daniel prayed, and the Lord heard him. And the Lord sent an angel into the den of lions and closed their mouths, so that they did no injury to Daniel. Has he saved you from the lions? O oh, king, my God has saved me because I was found innocent before him. Daniel! Free him! Free Daniel from the dead of lions! My king. Listen to me! All of you, listen! I make this decree. Throughout the kingdom I rule, men shall tremble in reverence before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He saves and he delivers. He does signs and wonders in the heavens and in the earth. It is he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. I embrace thee, Daniel, child of God. say this, and say it simply, faith, faith in a divine power that stayed the fury of the beast, faith that Daniel clung to through the terrible night of the lions, faith and prayer that sent an angel of God to Daniel, man of Judah, man of God. Arnold and Dr. Peel will return in just a moment. Today is Advent Sunday, the start of the season that heralds the coming of Christmas. And this year, to add to the enjoyment of these next few weeks, and also to add to the appreciation of the true spirit of Christmas, Hallmark Cards are introducing the charming old world custom of sending Advent cards. Wait till you see these impressive new cards with the intriguing lift-ups. These large, beautifully designed cards tell Christmas stories in pictures and verses. Children especially will love the day-by-day -day anticipation of waiting to see what's under the next lift-up. Each picture and verse is on a little window, or lift-up, that you open one at a time on each day between December 1st and Christmas Eve. For instance, one of the new Hallmark Advent cards tells the story of the first Christmas. It looks like a biblical painting. The first lift-up continues this inspiring story, 
till on December 24th, the last one reveals the scene in the manger. Shut-ins or friends in the hospital will also enjoy these cards that are also a gift and a Christmas decoration, for they can enjoy them day after day for 24 days. There are 10 different Hallmark Advent cards now on display at the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. Each costs only 50 cents or $1. But remember, they should be mailed to reach your friends or favorite youngster by December 1st. So in the next few days, look for the Advent cards with the famous Hallmark and Crown to show you care enough to send the very best. Now, here is Edward Arnold with Dr. Peel. Uh, Dr. Peel, I want to tell you how honored we are by your return visit to our Hallmark Hall of Fame. I know all of our friends have admired your inspiring writings and your famous books and columns. Well, I've enjoyed this evening immensely, and especially because I believe so strongly in the value of programs like your Hallmark Hall of Fame. Your stories do more than entertain. They leave you with something to think about. And to make this doubly valuable and stimulating, your stories are about real people. I know, too, Dr. Peel, that all of us in the Hallmark family are very proud of those beautiful messages you've written for a series of new Hallmark Christmas cards. I'm sure many, many people will be warmed and inspired by those words this Christmas. And I'd like to invite you to hear our program for next week. We are dramatizing the story of Wyatt Earp, perhaps the West's greatest single force for law and order. More than any other man, his fearlessness helped pave the way for America's migration west. Well, that sounds most intriguing. I shall certainly be tuned in next week. Good night, Dr. Peel. And now this is Edward Arnold saying, won't you join us next Sunday? Until then, good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card, one you carry enough to send the very best. The Hallmark Hall of Fame is produced and directed by William Krug. Tonight's transcribed script by David Friedkin and Morton Fine. Vic Perrin was featured as Daniel. Others in our cast were Ed Barrier, John Daner, Lou Krugman, Paula Winslow, Barney Phillips, and Charlotte Lawrence. Next week, the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television presents a true story from the life of Alexander Hamilton about one of the most exciting presidential elections that the country has ever known. We wish to take this opportunity to thank Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios and the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists for their cooperation in helping make last Sunday's broadcast possible. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you until next week at this same time when you hear a true story from the life of United States Marshal Wyatt Earp on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network.